Hello, it is uh, CJ. I'm in Shreveport, Louisiana. This is uh, downtown Shreveport. Uh, and uh, we're across the Red River from beautiful Bossier City, Louisiana. And of course, you can see the reflection of uh, my table with the lamps. And uh, I, it's kind of like this is kind of like, uh, you know, becomes kind of like uh, where I put everything. So I've got like a tambourine, some maracas. Uh, my wallet, <laughs> you know, just whatever. I'm sorry about that. I wasn't thinking about the reflection when I decided to do this video. Otherwise, I would have cleaned the table. But anyway, um, because I, I like when I'm listening to music, I do like to jam alongside of it. But that's not what this video is about. This video, uh, firstly, is so I can tell you how how much I love my city, uh, and my not just the city. I love downtown Shreveport, but I love every. Yeah, you know, I love. Uh, Bozier. I love going to the Bozier Boardwalk and everything. Um, it's very clear outside. There's some uh, cloudiness in the air, but I don't know. We're supposed to get, I don't know, some sort of frigid, wintry weather that everybody's been talking about that they've been afraid of. And I think <laughs> there was some new thing, but it's not new. And they were talking about the, um, what, the, the Arctic vortex or something. I don't know. Uh, I just, you know, that's how that's how uninformed I am, but I think uh, the potential for it to like dip below its average position because it's always there, uh, right? It's it's kind of like the Gulf Stream; it's always moved. So it's kind of like that, but it's a current. And uh, when conditions are favorable, it dips below its uh, uh, trajectory, like the path kind of goes down instead of straight across. You know, I'm not a meteorologist, but so normally it would go straight across, but every once in a while it it kind of dips like a lifeline, I guess. I don't know. But I think even that, it must be essential. Uh, I think the the wind currents and Gulf Stream and stuff like that, when they change, I think uh, it's a reaction. Uh, and I think it's a, uh, it's a correct, it's a, it's a, how can I say it? Correctatory? Is that a word? I don't know. It's a correctatory action. <laughs> if it's not a word, it is now. It's an action of correction, uh, of correction by nature, you know. Uh, anyway, it's a response. And so, a res you know, uh, whether it corrects anything or not, it's an attempt to, uh, <laughs> even, even if, if not by, uh, if not by specific intelligence of, of the earth, then just by its, uh, nature and by what's part of it but you know i, th I think the whole planet's living you know i, th I think there are micro it's like, it's like the earth it's kind of like the great barrier reef whereas uh it's it's the great barrier re reef we consider the whole thing to be alive not just uh not just living things living in a rock or sponge or something like that whatever you know a, a bit of coral, but we actually consider the whole thing alive and growing. Uh, that also is teeming with individual life. So I don't know. I think, I think of the earth kind of like that, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I guess I got on this. I, I kind of bird walk, go off on little tangents when I'm talking. Uh, but, uh, I think what's going on is, uh, really not much. I mean, it's, it's, it's low. We have, you know, the 27 degree temperatures and stuff like that. Maybe there's, maybe the grass is crinkly or cold or something. I haven't been out, but we were supposed to, everybody was like, Hey, we're going to get snow. And I'm like, I don't really think so. I think I read when people started talking about it, I read and I'm like, well, I don't think it really normally doesn't affect our area this far down South with any sort of tremendous. And they were like, well, do you remember the, the snowstorms a few years ago, we called it snowmageddon or snow. What that was, Two major uh, snowstorms, uh, and because it, it, uh, you guys will probably remember it, because it really affected most of the country, uh, and uh, Texas after the, after the result of it, because they have an independent uh, power grid, they were without power a lot longer than the rest of the country as they tried to work on uh, uh, their technical stuff. But uh, yeah, that was the result of basically two blizzards back to back. Like we had a major snow thing come down for a few days and then we had another one uh <laughs> and 
It was so funny because it came in from the Southeast, both of those. And I remember the funny thing is I, I had this kind of, uh, uh, I was doing some studying about the uh, phenomenon of the Mothman, which is a, a Northeastern uh, myth out of the Northeast United States. And uh, it, it it made me curious because there's some correlation between uh, uh that figure and uh, the figure of Pazuzu, uh, which was, you know, not the demon in the exorcist, by the way, uh, but it actually is a demigod in Syria, of course, but not a, a demon figure. It's, it's a demon that doesn't, I mean, he's not a demon. He's a, he's a demigod that really didn't take any crap from, uh, and kind of is really the protector of his region, but is harsh over his uh constituents he's a protector of women and children so it kind of you know in a way uh the fact that uh whatever i don't want to get off on all that but it's so funny it's, it's very fascinating he's he's not he's not a demon but anyway i had ordered a uh pendant <laughs> uh from like one of those uh maybe it was wish or something like that i don't know but that had the, like the little uh, pazuzu head on it you know because that's typically how he was like uh uh, regarded by the people that, that looked to him. So I thought, how interesting. So I ordered it and this little uh, Pazuzu pendant came in and uh, you know, the little statue and stuff. The one that was like represented, you know, with the little uh, dog head and the little, and his paw up and the snake and everything. It was so weird. But um, the day that it arrived was the day that that second storm came in and just laid down on top of everything. And it was like, it was so interesting because the domain of Pazuzu is the southwestern winds, so I thought, how fun! Uh, what a fun little coincidence, or whatever. So, but uh, yeah, uh, snowmageddon. But we don't have anything like that. We're not getting snow or anything like that. And I didn't think that we would. And I, th I think people were just kind of like, eh, maybe. I don't know. When there's not that much going on in the world, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And there is a lot going on in the world. But locally, there's not. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like, um, I mean, there, there's always a, there's a big world. There's a lot going on in it at all times. But when there's not much going on locally, they have to do something to get your attention. And there there are reasons to be cautious, cautious and everything. But, um, yeah, weather-wise, I, I just, I don't know. Really not that much to speak of. That being said... Let me get to the real reason for this video. Lamb chops, brah. So <laughs> I've got uh, these uh, a package of lamb chops soaking in the in this milk, uh, and I like to uh, do this because it helps get a, it helps provide some tenderness, but also kind of helps uh, you know with cuts of meat sometimes. Uh, it's this is rich in omega three fatty acids. Uh, and so that provides a stronger taste. It's not, it's not, uh, nearly as prevalent in like beef and things like that. You know, some, some of the, some of the, some of the qualities that give it its potency. So there are ways to chemically react with it. Uh, it's good to read up on food chemistry, the way uh, chemistry works, such as there's a lot of people that really get fixated when they're looking at food, how to prepare food. And they get stuck on this idea called the the Maillard effect or the Maillard reaction. Uh, typically when you're frying, but also when you're baking anywhere, I want to say between 230 to 350 around that temperature. Uh, I know it, it's something that happens where your uh, sh the natural sugars that are prevalent uh, get a little caramelized and it adds extra flavors and everything like that. And then they also, you know, when we talk about that, we also consider that it's mildly carcinogenic. Uh, <laughs> and you know what that means is that uh, mildly carcinogenic means that if you were to eat every single one of your meals, uh, <laughs> trying to reach uh, a doneness that's at the Maillard effect, mildly carcinogenic potentially could stack up and become uh moderately carcinogenic at, at least i don't know I, I don't put too much uh fret into it uh as we used to say when i was growing up i ain't studying it <laughs> i ain't studying it uh, i'm not studying it i'm not thinking about it whatever anyway so what um 
<laughs> angst, doesn't it? But uh, so it means that, um, you know, just prepare your food the way you enjoy it and everything like that. Don't don't really worry about getting, uh, you know, the, the mailer reaction. It's, you know, whatever. It's, it's incidental. I don't think there's anything that we consume that uh, in some way, shape, or form is, is not mildly carcinogenic, uh, taken into excess anyway. And I have a keto diet, meaning that, uh, meaning that I try to, uh, not exceed, uh, 50 carbs within a day. And I try on my best day, not to, uh, not to go, uh, above 800. I'm doing great today. It's a Sunday. Uh, that's apropos, uh, not really anything, but it is Sunday. Yesterday I had, a uh, um, prepared some, uh, mac and cheese with some hamburger in it, you know, just out of a box, nothing special. Uh, but, um, but so I decided today would be a day that I fasted mainly just because it got around to being in the evening and I haven't prepared dinner yet. And I'm like, well, you know, I may as well go ahead and just turn it into a, turn it into a day of fast. It's, uh, uh, 8 PM right now. Uh, am I, fasting, my, my calorie, everything that I do as far as this kind of stuff starts at midnight. I just figured, hey, uh, you know, I'm up late, Sunday. I'm up late anyway. So midnight's a good day for it. So midnight, you know, uh, so yeah. So at midnight, this will probably be ready. So what I'm doing is I'm, I've got these lamb chops. There's a full package of, uh, here. they're very meaty, very, see, they're huge. With lamb chops, I like them cut kind of thick, and yeah. So, I don't have to rinse my fingers off momentarily. What I'll do with this is I'll let this soak in the in the in in this milk, just straight up whole milk. Let it break down the meat and everything, because uh, there's a chemical reaction that happens with that, with the acidity reacting and everything. It's really great. And then I'll put some flavors on it, uh, cumin, which uh, basically is a is a very powerful herb among herbs you know and uh that'll be the basis uh that i'll do with this but you can do uh you know i'll, I'll throw some garlic in there too anything that's strong in flavor kind of helps uh accent because this is good you know lamb has a strong flavor anyway so you go ahead and use strong flavors to balance out you know um if you wanted to use uh some sugar you could, uh, but for me, I don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to add sugar. Uh, and then I'll have as a side, uh, maybe, uh, some of the leftover, uh, mac and cheese or something like that. So, cause I have some leftover mac and cheese. I normally with, with hamburger meat in it, <laughs> ground beef. I don't normally like leftover mac and cheese, but the way I prepared, the one the other day, uh, is, um, I, I prepare it with a lot of, uh, liquid and then as it cools, uh, and then I add, uh, to, to the excessive liquid, uh, which is, you know, more milk and more butter. Yeah. Uh, what I do is I add, uh, extra cheese. In this case, it was, uh, did I add to it? Was it Havarti? I think I added more Havarti, uh, which is a soft uh, cheese that I cut into. You'll, you, you'll see some of it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's macaroni and cheese. It's not really anything worth uh, making a uh, <laughs> video about, so I didn't. But anyway, I'm going to pause this, and then when I get around to doing the, uh, getting this prepared, I'll continue the video. And, uh, yeah. Um, so, Hang tight. Uh, it'll be a few hours for me. It'll be um, uh, just a short pause for you guys. Until then. Ah, by the way, the word I was reaching for before is corrective. Uh, the weather pattern possibly is corrective. Um, what I'd say? Correctory? <laughs> I, I will, I'm prone to make up words as I'm pontificating uh, my just 
thoughts. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, when I do that, I like to call those words, uh, Cecilisms. It's a, it's a joke that my friends and I had back in the day. We would call them Cecilisms. But anyway, um, my, cause my, would just make up some weird words or whatever. So anyway, corrective Tory, corrective Tory, whatever, but it's corrective. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, let this uh, go into the fridge. I forgot to tell you when I'm letting this marinade in this milk uh, and tenderize, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna do it in the fridge. Uh, and then I will take it out probably about half an hour before it's time to cook uh, to let it get to room temperature. But until then it does need to be uh, kept chilled. Ha, huh. okay, so uh, I am obviously about to tune in Crosses on Infinite Earths uh, part one, Justice League Crisis on Infinite Earths, part one. It's uh, an animated special I've been looking forward to, and I'll be looking forward to the second one coming out. I'm very excited about it, but I'm a little bit of a purist when it comes to things like this. Uh, <laughs> and I suppose it was just for simplicity, but based on characters from DC and the graphic novel Crisis on Infinite Earths, well... Uh, this, this subject matter, the source material, uh, was at one point, uh, and I have it, put into a graphic novel. But a, it's, it's, it's not a graphic novel. That, that, that is a collection of uh, comic books that came out in 1985 uh, when the creators of the source material uh, had proposed and then tasked, uh, and then were tasked with, a uh, cleaning house at DC, you know, to streamline storylines and, uh, get rid of properties that were not selling, uh, and, uh, build up, uh, you know, just to streamline everything. So, and it, it and it did for a while. And then of course, uh, as more and more creators uh, throughout the decades, Kevin, you find out, hey, you really can't uh, just uh, have one storyline and, and uh, or one universe or whatever. You're going to have uh, various uh, ideas and intellectual properties and everything like that. It was a great idea, and it did, uh, you know, uh, expound upon a lot of things. It, it really just... Uh, yeah, it was great. Anyway, but my thing is, <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't originally a graphic novel, so that, that's they should have uh, uh, they should have called it uh, the series, the comic book series, based on the characters from the DC comic book series Crisis on Infinite Earths, circa nineteen eighty five or something like that. You know, get 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 tremendous with it. Oh, by the way, it was uh, a vast. Uh, undertaking for the DC company at the time because it wasn't just the uh, the various issues. Uh, and I, I posted about Crisis on Infinite Earths earlier in my... I uh, had the graphic novel. I posted about it earlier in my YouTube. Uh, go scroll back a few months, you'll see it. But, uh, yeah, it's like... Uh, it's like all the tie-ins. There were all the different comic books, all the different characters, you know, Flash... Uh, had a tie-in, Swamp Thing had a tie-in, Wonder Woman, Super... They all had tie-ins. Tie uh, so it wasn't just a series, but it was like all this kind of stuff. So I would love to one day, and I don't know if this is or not, I haven't, I'm about to watch it, but I would love to one day see a complete Crisis on Infinite Earths with the comic books and all the other comic books that tied into it. And of course, there were various... Uh, after that, every few years or every, I don't know, for every every so-and-so, they would come out with a, a crisis, a crisis thing or whatever, that, you know, that they, that, that kind of like echoed back to what happened on Crisis on Infinite Earths. But that was, that was the first one. So it's such an important part of DC history. It was, it's almost as important to DC history as Action Comics uh, Superman, you know. The uh, the uh, coming forth of Superman. That's how um, that's how important uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths is to anyone uh, post Crisis. 
I was pre-crisis as a, as a teenager, as reading these comic books, because uh, we lived right up the street from the KB drugstore that I used to get, uh, or KNB. It was KB Toys and KMB drugstores, and then they later became Eckerd's. But anyway, I was right up the street from it, and so I'd go there every week with my allowance, and I'd buy, you know, my favorite comic books: Superman, Wonder Woman, uh, um, Spider Man. <laughs> you know, anything anything that I liked. You know, uh, and the one offs were great too, where they'd have like the Superman crossing over with Joker, all that. So I loved it. And then we moved away. To a different area of town and I didn't have anything close by to get I didn't have a way close by to get comic books so my collection dropped off and then uh, we ended up uh, um, you know getting a car being mobile because <laughs> you know, when we moved we didn't have a car uh, but and then we got a car as a family so then it was like okay cool I can get to and from uh, that store at the mall and I can buy uh, my comic books and uh by then crisis on infinite earths had begun so i kind of in my mind missed the beginning of the crisis uh, on infinite earths but i picked it up uh, i want to say around episode seven i think it was the one where yeah it was the one where uh super, supergirl sacrifices her life to save her cousin which of course was her uh, entire mission for even being on earth in the first place. So she really did fulfill her purpose. And it was great to see that come to, uh, in retrospect, to see that bit of her narrative come, come to a conclusion. But uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to watch this and then I'm going to like pause the video. Then I'm going to get back to the food. If I talk too much about this, there won't be room to talk about food. So here we have the um, well marinated uh, lamb chops that I've, I've left in the fridge uh, in milk for uh, several hours and now we're gonna move on. So this is my uh, dry seasoning, my dry sprinkle, rub, whatever. Uh, heavy on cumin uh, seed, which you can see, and then there's a little garlic, a little onion, a little this and that, you know, whatever you have that's like a potent, powerful, uh, herb uh you want to you want to use that uh because the meat has a strong powerful flavor um even though it's going to be well marinated it's still going to have a strong flavor so you want to balance that uh with other flavors that are also uh powerful so let's see what's up all right so here we are with the uh well coating uh well coated lamb chops one two three four five six seven eight uh two to three lamb chops per serving uh this could serve probably three probably four people depending upon what you were serving it with and because it's a strong uh flavor uh you know uh, a couple of lamb chops per serving even even could do well uh provided maybe whatever else you were serving with it uh, you know a hearty salad uh, good carb or something like that on the side of it, but I'm having uh, I'm gonna have mine with uh, maybe just some leftover uh, mac and cheese uh, with a little bit of uh, hamburger in the mac and cheese so that I made. So uh, anyway, this has to rest uh, probably for about it's got to come to room temperature. I'm gonna let it sit out for probably about twenty. Uh, minutes or so uh and then of course it's on a uh wire rack that's going to go into my uh um air fryer oven on the air fry section but it's basically uh yeah we'll call it air fry but air fry really is not really frying it's really just convection oven baking uh you know, it, it, it gets a crispiness, uh, you know, whatever's going on in there. So it, it that can be, uh, you know, uh, considered a air fry. But usually when they think of an air fry product, it's usually, it's usually something like chicken nuggets or something, you know, something that already comes pre-breaded. Yeah. And maybe the breading is pre crisp and then, and then frozen, you know, so it's, it's fine for like packaged foods and stuff like that. Uh, but that's in that way, uh, 
or or a French fry or something like that. But in that way, it, it can be like an air frying, like you may be considered a fry, but you know, but eh, you know, it's um it's really just a convection oven and air fryer, you know. Uh, what maybe might make the difference would be would the heat source come from top and bottom. Or would it come from the top or would it come from the bottom? But since it gets circulated by a fan, uh, you know, it's it's generally uh, uh, kind of an ancillary point. Uh, it's a matter of definition. Um, but yeah, I'm going to let this rest. I'll come back and I'll show you a, a finished product. Oh, and so as that meat is resting before it goes in, I'm going to do a quick review on me, my impression of uh, Justice League Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 1. I think they um, took an interesting approach. They kind of focused a lot on the Barry Allen narrative, who is uh, the Flash, who um, maybe, maybe they pulled in uh, – some of the backstory. The fact is, Crisis on Infinite Earths in in the 1985 kind of takes place after the death of Iris West, who 